All right, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Bob Cordell. That was a magnificent presentation by, by <laughs> uh, Nelson. He's uh, just great, and he has a tremendous ability to uh, convey fairly complex concepts to people. And I, uh, I don't think I'm quite that good, but I'm going to give it a shot anyway. Uh, and in fact, uh, I love output stages too, and uh, we're very much in agreement on uh, uh, how to do output stages and, and what's good and bad about them. Um, actually, my talk complements that a little bit. Uh, I decided to uh, discuss a revamp of the legendary Hafler power amplifier. And in fact, uh, it was one of the first amplifiers to use lateral MOSFETs, um, which of course um, uh, have a lot of advantages, as Nelson pointed out. Uh, there's a lot of trade-offs. I've, over the years, also liked verticals better. Um, but I thought that uh, I would redo that amplifier, and the, the main thing that I had in mind was the front end, rather than the power amplifier, or the output stage. Um, there's a very uh, popular front end topology called a full complementary input stage that uh, over the years um, has been used by a lot of people, but the, it's, the JFET version of it uh, has been sort of a little bit crippled of late because uh, it used Toshiba transistors that, that went out of production quite a while back. But, uh, Thanks to uh, my friends at Linear Systems, uh, as Paul just mentioned, they've come out with these full complementary parts, the 489 and the 689. So I decided to uh, use the, an old Hafler 220 uh, as a test vehicle for building an amplifier using these and to demonstrate that these parts are really great for new designs that want to use that good old um, full complementary input stage. So um, can we have the next slide, please? Now, just uh, as, a, as a quick start here, this is a schematic of the uh, BH220. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. It was a well thought out amplifier for its time. It had good performance. And um, if you look over here on the left, you see the full complementary differential input stage. That means that there's two differential pairs. One is based on, in this case, NPN bi bipolar transistors. In this case, down here, PNP bipolar transistors. And uh, so that's why it's called full complementary. Um, one of the big advantages of this architecture is that it gives you a push-pull second stage. If you only had one of these, up top, you would have to have a single-ended uh, intermediate stage, the voltage amplifier stage, or what we call the VAS. And then down here would be the, a current source. And that doesn't have as much poop to it. Uh, so just like push-pull output stages, they have uh, advantages in terms of their ability to drive loads. In the Hafler, uh, this topology was done with bipolar transistors. Uh, many people since then, uh, including Hafler in their 280, uh, used JFETs. And um, I'm a very big fan of JFET front ends. Uh, so I wanted to use, obviously, to upgrade this to use the JFETs. Uh, can I have the next slide? Now, just as a very, very quick introduction, some foundation setting, this is a traditional um, widely used input stage, which is only, uh, only produces a single-ended signal for the VAS. So you only have a single-ended VAS there. Um, this input stage is uh, very much like the beginnings of, um, say, Doug Self's amplifier. Uh, this topology has been around since the beginning of DIRT, I think. <laughs> Actually, uh, Bob Weidler over at National Semiconductor uh, came up with a big part of this uh, topology in the late 60s doing an op amp. Um, and you can see it's differential. There's a, what we call a current mirror up top, which basically does a very nice conversion of those 
two differential signals coming out of the collectors of those NPN devices converts it to a single-ended signal to, to drive the subsequent transistor that forms the voltage amplifier stage. Uh, next slide, please. Here we have the same essential thing. It's not quite as sophisticated yet. We'll get to that in the next slide. But uh, the point here is that we've converted that to a, a JFET version. Uh, and in fact, you can see that I'm using the linear systems LSK489 device there. Now, JFETs are a beautiful thing for the input of a power amplifier. First of all, um, they don't require any bias current going into them. And uh, in, the, in the bipolar designs, the, the base current, the bias current, really causes us a lot of headaches in terms of what we can do uh, to keep the offset down in the output. Um, with the JFETs, you have much, much greater freedom to pick the resistance values in the networks here uh, going in. For example, um, for low noise and for some other very good reasons, you really like to have, let's see, I should have, here's my pointer. Um, I thought I brought my pointer with me. You really like to have a low impedance uh, feedback network there. Uh, you see the 27K resistor and the 1K resistor on the right there. And um, there we go. Sorry for that delay. You like to have that be a fairly low impedance network um, for among other reasons it keeps down the noise. But in a lot of cases, um, with bipolars, if you have input base current, to get low offset, you really want this resistor, which is the base return resistor on the input side. Ideally, you can show that if you make this the same value as this resistor, you'll get just about zero offset. Uh, but you really would, would rather not have the input impedance here go down too low. I mean, 10K is okay, but in a design like this, this capacitor, which has to be a high quality capacitor, uh, in order to preserve your low frequencies, you make that resistor smaller, this capacitor has to be much bigger. So the JFETs give us the freedom to, to basically independently design these two, these two sides. Now the other thing about JFETs you have to keep in mind is if, if you have a moderately high power amplifier, and I'm talking like 100 watts or more, you have a power supply rail, in this case 55 volts, um, and that is too much voltage to have across the JFETs. Usually JFETs are rated around 40 volts, something like that. So in this case, um, just like Nelson mentioned for output stages, we put in a CAS code here, and in this case, those JFETs are only subjected to a 15 volt power supply or about 15 volts uh, drain to source. Um, so that's, that's a little extra added cost that you usually have to put in for a JFET input stage, apart from the usual uh, increased cost of the JFET itself. Um, one other thing about JFETs I wanted to mention is that they are much more resistant to electromagnetic interference. And a lot of people believe that uh, EMI is a factor in the sound quality of some amplifiers. The reason for that is with a bipolar um, between the base and the emitter, you had a, a turned on semiconductor junction. So a little bit of high frequency um, added into that can cause intermodulation and it can come into the audio band for you. In a JFET, you do have uh, a PN junction, but it's reverse biased because um, as Nelson pointed out, this, a JFET, is a depletion device, which means you have to have a negative voltage here with respect to the source in order to control the amount of current it's taking. So nicely, this junction here is reverse biased, and it is, as a result, it's much less likely to cause uh, intermodulation distortion when there's a high frequency disturbance that goes in there. That's one of the reasons that I believe that JFET input stages 
are more desirable and often sound better. There's other reasons too. They, they turn on and turn off much, much more gradually than bipolar transistors. They clip more softly and all sorts of things. So they're a nice part to work with. Um, next slide, please. Um, in this case, we have uh, modified that stage by putting in a second transistor, which is a common thing to do in the voltage amplifier. That gives you two things. First of all, you see a higher impedance looking into there, which loads this left less. And it also gives you a higher voltage uh, turn-on bias that you need to turn on this pair of transistors. It's really uh, two base emitter drops plus whatever is across the 36 ohm resistor. That means you can use a larger resistor here and you get more gain out of the input stage. Now it's important to have gain in the input stage for purposes of noise. Um, if you had an input stage that only had a gain of 1.0, the noise contribution of the voltage amplifier stage would be just as important as that of the input stage. Ideally, when you want low noise, the input stage should be the limiting factor on the noise. Everything else should be almost a non-contributor. So in this simple example, um, the gain is greater than one, fortunately, 1.7. Um, the other thing that adding this emitter follower here in front of the, the main uh, voltage amplifier transistor is that there is no Miller effect. Now this is nonlinear capacitance. Remember Nelson mentioned that in the output transistors, the co input capacitance changing with voltage causes distortion. In a normal situation with a bipolar, the collector base also, uh, that capacitance also changes with voltage. When we didn't have this transistor here, that variation in capacitance caused the gain of this stage to change with signal and you get distortion. So this buffering provided by this additional emitter follower transistor basically isolates it and eliminates it. Next slide, please. Now as I shown, showed in the first slide um, with the bipolars, here we have a virtually the same example where we have taken the cascoded differential pair um, of JFETs and loaded it with a current mirror instead of a resistor. And as a result here, uh, we get a much, much higher gain at low frequencies uh, because there's really no load resistance. That what, what you're looking into there is a very high impedance. So this will now produce um, quite a bit more current output also to drive the voltage amplifier stage. You can see that in the limit, if you bias this uh, with a, what we call a tail current of four milliamps, um, these guys can seesaw and of course at, in the limit all of the current can flow in, in Q1 and come out over here this way or all the current can flow in Q2 and come out and go the other way. So that's a nice nice easy thing to do and it, it really causes improved linearity and again more current driving ability for the vast. The higher gain that's implicit here also gives you that gain that reduces the relative noise contribution of the subsequent circuitry like, like the, the VAS. Next slide, please. Okay, this is the same circuit pretty much, but with the higher capacitance LSK389. That's a little hard to see, I apologize for that. And as Paul mentioned, the 389 is a lower noise device, but it's at the expense of higher capacitance. And a lot of people love to use the 389 in low noise applications, especially low level preamps like phono preamps, things like that. Uh, even in an audio amplifier, uh, it's, it's nice to have that low noise. However, that higher capacitance that you see uh, in the 389, in an ordinary arrangement, you've got these um, gate signals going up and down with the input signal. 
So what happens is the voltage from the gate to the drain of these FETs is changing with signal, and once again, that can cause distortion. Particularly, that varying capacitance can cause distortion um, because it's changing the gain bandwidth of the, uh, the network here. You basically have the impedance of this 1K and a little bit of the 27K against that capacitance. And once again, when the signal changes in amplitude, the capacitance changes and that causes some distortion. So in this case, we had to cast code these JFETs anyway, just for purposes of voltage capability. But in this case, we, we call this a driven cast code. And what happens here, and, and it's really the same thing that, that Nelson described in the output stage, is we take the signal, we make a replica of that feedback signal. This, so this signal ideally is virtually the same as this signal, and we use it to drive these cast code transistors up and down with the signal. So essentially, once again, the voltage from drain to gate on both of these largely doesn't change with signal. So that eliminates a source of distortion that can happen particularly in higher capacitance JFETs. When I use the 489, I don't bother with this trick because they have much lower input capacitance. So there, there's a trade-off between using those two transistors. They're both great transistors, but if you're making a moving coil preamp, for example, that, that wants to be a FET one, um, you use 389s because they much, have much lower voltage noise and the impedance that, that they see at their input is very low because it's coming from a mo moving coil cartridge. Next slide, please. Here we see, once again, um, now we have the JFET input stage with the current mirror. Um, did that go back? Yeah. Or, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, one other trick is that uh, this current mirror, as you saw before, you saw a connection right from here to here. Here, we call this, this is a helper transistor. And what this does is it's like an emitter follower and it supplies the base current that these transistors need. So it causes actually DC wise a much, much better match in the current that has to go here and here because otherwise when you had the connection going directly from here to here, all of the base current for these guys had to come from this node and it was taking away and it was causing an imbalance. Uh, this is a trick that's used uh, very, very extensively in, in integrated circuits. Now another interesting thing that this thing does for you is it changes the voltage, collector base voltage on this transistor. When we had that connected directly there, the collector base voltage was zero volts. Now an NPN transistor will work just fine with zero volts collector to base but if you ask it to draw a significant amount of current, its beta begins to, to degrade at those low collector base voltages. Uh, sometimes we call that quasi-saturation because the, the transistor is getting into the region where it's not operating ideally. When you put in this helper transistor, now you can see that you've got about 7 tenths of a volt of collector base voltage. And this, this transistor here is much, much happier with that. Now notice though, that when we combine this with the voltage amplifier stage that has what the two emitter followers or what we often call conveniently a Darlington VAS, you notice that we've got a two, two VBE, voltage from base to emitter. We use that term a lot, it's very convenient. So you see, apart from the voltage drop on this resistor, we have a 2VBE voltage drop here. But we also, over here to this node, have a 2VBE voltage drop. So these two nodes now are operating, as you can see, at the same voltage. And we're gonna take advantage of that later. But the nice part is that 
both of these transistors are operating in a happy mode where they have a decent amount of collector base voltage. The other thing that we did in this circuit is that these degeneration resistors, obviously they have a certain amount of voltage drop. We've set the bias values and the values of these resistors such that the voltage drop across this resistor is the same as the voltage drop across these resistors. So once again, we've reinforced the fact that these two nodes are operating at the same voltage. And once again, when I get a little bit later on, we'll see how we can take advantage of that. Next slide, please. Uh, before we go a little bit further, uh, we talked about earlier uh, in Nelson's talk, somebody asked a question about DC offset. And um, one of the things that uh, I like to do, and a lot of other people like to do it as well, is we put in a servo circuit. And basically, this is an integrator, and it looks at the output of the amplifier. And uh, this part right here is an integrator circuit. So if this voltage here um, becomes different from zero, uh, it causes this capacitor to charge up and this node to move with a lot of potential gain. And, and it goes through this, this is just an inverter here to get the, the sign right. And it basically automatically creates a correction voltage that's injected right here to force the output to virtually zero volt. What it actually does is it forces it to a voltage that's equal to approximately the input offset of this operational amplifier. It's a wonderful thing, and it also eliminates the need, it, it, I didn't touch on it before, but in, in conventional amplifiers without a DC servo, over here, you may have seen in one of the earlier slides, you needed to put a big electrolytic capacitor in series with this resistor to bring the gain down to unity at DC so there wasn't a lot of offset that got to the output. Electrolytic capacitors in the signal path are usually not a good idea. Now, if you use a really, really good uh, nonpolar electrolytic that's rated at a decent amount of voltage, you can get the distortion down pretty far. And in fact, one thing uh, that, that was a nice trick, and I, I'm not sure they're still available, but Nichicon made electrolytic capacitors, nonpolars, specifically for use in loudspeaker crossover networks. So they had the voltage rating, they, were, they paid a lot of attention to the distortion they did, and I found that they were great to use in applications where you had a capacitor in series here. But normally, it's nicer to just get rid of that capacitor. Sometimes it's not that small. The worst thing, by the way, that you can do, that some people do, is they'll put a capacitor in here with a low voltage rating thinking, ah, you know, there's only signal here, swings a couple of volts, and so, some people could even be tempted to put in, you know, like maybe a 16 volt capacitor there. That just exacerbates things terribly. Never use a low voltage capacitor in that application. The voltage rating of a capacitor isn't only there for being able to handle a lot of voltage, but it also makes the capacitor much more linear for smaller voltage changes. So that's a trick. If you're not going to use a DC servo, use a real good capacitor there. And even if you use a crossover capacitor that you buy from like Parts Express, Dayton Audio, you know, um, microfarads at 50 volts or 100 volts. Um, I looked at those when I wrote my book and measured them carefully, and they, they measure great. So that's an example of Use a crop speaker crossover capacitor if you're going to have to use one. Uh, but the DC servo takes care of all of that. The, there's a couple of quick caveats about the DC servo, though. It really is in the signal path. A lot of people think, oh, you know, it's just a control circuit. It's not doing anything. But if you think about it, it's in the control path in two different ways. First of all, some of the signal, some of the output signal, you know, gets integrated, comes through here, comes back to here. Usually very, very little, but some. Second of all, you, you have um, current sometimes, 
even though you have, you have a fairly small signal swing here, just about equal to the input, um, there's some current that can go, come back through this resistor and into the output of that op amp. And op amp output stages for ordinary op amps, uh, are, they often operate in class B. Looking into that output node, you see some nonlinearity. The point that I want to make here is number one, in my mind, the op amp that you use in your DC servo should be an audio grade op amp. Don't skimp on that. I'm using an OPA 2134 dual. Uh, they're not that expensive. Oftentimes the DC servo circuit doesn't really take up any more space than the big old high quality electrolytic you would have needed in, instead. And sometimes it costs less as well. So that's, that's one thing. The other thing uh, that you should do in this circuit is this integrator capacitor. Make that a high quality capacitor. Make it a poly polypropylene. Don't go for a mylar there. Just remember, attention to detail, everything matters, and this really is in the signal path. Next slide, please. Before I go on to the fully complementary, uh, a lot of people some people use a folded cast code. It's a faster circuit um, because the signal, uh, and in the feedback loop, by the way, the signal path you care about is from the feedback up through here and out through here. In this case, uh, in the folded cast code, the output signal of the input differential pair is going into the emitter of the voltage amplifier stage. And that means that the uh, frequency response of this stage operating in cascode mode is a much, much higher frequency response, less, less phase lag, less instability in the feedback loop. So this is a popular arrangement in some cases. Uh, the only thing with this, unfortunately, is that the signal value, the amount of signal available over here coming out of the voltage stage, signal current, is only equal to the amount of signal current coming out of the input stage. So you really don't have any current gain here. So this is still all you have to drive the output stage. So that's a disadvantage of the, of the folded CAS code. Um, but there are some ways, oh, one other thing I wanted to mention is this actually also reduces the effective input gain of the input stage. So the noise that you get in the voltage amplifier stage is just as important as the noise that you had in these FETs. So that kind of violates the uh, ideal rule of the input stage should be the dominant source of noise and everything else should be much less. Um, so that's why I mentioned we should watch the noise there. Uh, please go to the next slide. Now this one, um, I know it looks a little bit complicated, but all we really did here was we put in a current mirror, and I haven't seen this before, but it seems like a pretty obvious thing to do. The current mirror doubles the amount of current that you get out of this input stage, number one. Second of all, it's, it takes, makes it a differential to single-ended conversion, so you're taking it advantage of both of the signal currents here. Remember, in the previous slide, we threw away the signal current from one side. Now we're using both sides, and we've got differential arrangement. There's some common mode rejection, which is a good thing. And the amount of signal current we have is twice the amount of signal current that we had before. Before we had just one side's worth of signal current. Now, going in, to the CAS code, we have twice that. So we've, we've improved that. By the way, we also, in this case, used the LSK389 instead of the 489 because you can, you have more current, or uh, more transconductance, and you operate it at a higher current. So this arrangement um, makes the folded CAS code just work better. Uh, reduces some of the shortcomings of the folded cast code if, if you want to do that kind of a uh, architecture. Next slide, please. Okay, we finally got to the full complementary. 
which is really the, the main part of the talk here. Um, and again, as I said earlier, one of the key things of this, apart from the fact that it looks really, really nice on the schematic, doesn't that look nice and symmetrical and looks good to the eye and people that say symmetrical looking things normally, intuitively, they're going to sound better. So that's why this stage is very popular. In reality, it doesn't necessarily measure better, I'll tell you that. Um, but anyway, this is what we saw earlier in the Hafler. This is what they started out with. And um, I, uh, this is, uh, works pretty well. It's got a 100 volt per microsecond slew rate, which is pretty fast for an amplifier. Um, you do have to be careful of a couple of things here in this arrangement. Um, these pairs here, want to really be well matched DC wise and in fact if this one th if this pair is mismatched in the opposite direction of this pair you're going to have some fighting taking place and and the bias really goes off in in the wrong direction it becomes quite inaccurate secondly um, the second stage is becomes quite sensitive to the amount of bias current in the first stage. And notice that we have the plain old resistive load here. And so, you know, if, if you set this at the exact right amount, you will get the voltage drop on here that gives you the amount of bias current that you want here. But if these guys change a little bit, you know, the current in the voltage amplifier stage is going to change a lot. And in fact, uh, the sensitivity is a factor of, in this design, 2.6 to 1. So if this changes by 0.1 milliamp, this will change by 2.26 milliamps. So let's go to the next slide. The obvious thing is to use the current mirror. Okay, if we put a current mirror up here, current mirror down here, current mirror a forces both of these guys to operate at the same current and you can also much more easily arrange it so that the voltage drops here are coincident with the kind of voltage drop you got over here to turn this on. Uh, now we're not quite there yet because we haven't used that other trick that I showed you earlier with the helper transistor but you can see that we're moving in the direction of a design that has sort of mitigated some of the troubles of, of this uh, fully complementary input stage arrangement. Um, however, um, if you were to sit down with a piece of paper or a computer or a simulator, if you put simulators you have to be careful of because all the transistors are ideal, right? But um, in the real world, what you have in this circuit, if you really went through it with a pencil and paper, you would be able to see that the bias current of the voltage amplifier stage is actually undefined. It could be anywhere. And uh, unfortunately, one of the, uh, one of the earlier uh, amplifier books actually had this circuit in there, and a lot of people built it up and blew it up. So. Uh, it's a little bit of a disadvantage. In other words, there was an unintended consequence to our well-intentioned attempt to fix this circuit and make it a lot better with a current mirror. Let's go to the next step, slide, please. Well, it turns out, now we're getting into some of the advantages that I brought up earlier. Remember I said that if you use a helper current mirror with this helper transistor, you could arrange things in combination with the VAS so that these two nodes were operating at the same voltage. Now comes an opportunity. Since they're operating at the same voltage, we can put a load resistor across there without disturbing the DC arrangement. Now that we have a load resistor, we are back in the situation where we've reduced the DC gain of the input stage but not enough to really impair the performance. But we now have a situation where the voltage, the, the, the bias current of the voltage amplifier stage 
is now defined. And in fact, it's defined once again by the amount that this current drops across these two guys because that, current, that voltage on these nodes determines how much current is being carried in the voltage amplifier stage. So now you can see that some of these concepts are kind of like all starting to come together. We're still illustrating this with bipolar transistors, but uh, we'll, get, we'll get to the FETs very shortly. Um, so th the beautiful thing here is that this resistor, you can choose it to be virtually anything you want, depending upon how much risk to tolerance variations you're willing to take. Obviously, if you made this resistor infinity, you're back to the other problem where the, the current through the vast is undefined. If you make this resistor really, really small, you'll have very, very well defined current here, but the input stage gain will have gone very low, and then you're, then you're you know, getting more distortion because you have lower loop gain for the feedback, and you also have more noise. So this is a trade-off. This is a value that I've turned out to be comfortable with. Um, it does help if you make all of these resistors 1% resistors, good tolerance, because it does like to be matched up pretty well. Next slide, please. Okay, here we see uh, the beginnings. Once again, I hate to keep going forward and then backward, but sometimes that's the way I think. <laughs> uh, you can see that we now have a full complementary input stage using JFETs. They're both cast coded. And here we're using the newly available LSK489 and its complement, the LSK689. So now we're back to kind of like the good old days when Toshiba was making these kinds of parts. Uh, these parts are very rare and prized now and some manufacturers fortunately bought 10,000 of them before they went out of production. But um, for new designs, that's not such a good idea to put in a really obsolete transistor. So as Paul pointed out, they've come out with these complementary devices and, and now we're back to where it's really practical and affordable to build an amplifier with this very, very popular input stage architecture. Um, so everything else is pretty much, pretty much the same here. Uh, in this case, uh, we actually have a higher slew rate. We have 200 volts per microsecond, which is really, really up there for an audio power amplifier. And all else remaining equal, the more slew rate you have, the less high frequency distortion you'll tend to have. And um, it, it, it's going to be a better, a faster amplifier. Um, in the old days, there was this distortion called transient intermodulation distortion. And it really amounted to, uh, it was caused by inadequate slew rate in amplifiers back in the old days when they really didn't slew very much. 200 volts per microsecond is much, much, much more then you need to get out of that realm. So this is a nice, nice fast number. Um, there are a couple of things, though, that you do want to worry about. Uh, first of all, the offset in the pairs wants to be fairly low, uh, which is a very, very good reason to use dual monolithic MOSFETs. Uh, one of the things I overlooked earlier when I told you, even in the case of the bipolars, of the offsets not being matched and they would fight and mess up the bias. Um, if you were going to do that with bipolars and do it right, you would want to use dual monolithic bipolar transistors. And they're also quite a bit more expensive than just a pair of, you know, uh, ordinary single NPN transistors. So here, um, over, actually over some years now, there have been some people building this, this nice architecture, but without dual monolithic devices. So for example, uh, if they didn't have the, the dual monolithic Toshiba devices, they might use a discrete, maybe an LSK170, something like that here, or 
in a, in a uh, 2SJ76, maybe here. Um, but they would be individual devices. And FETs uh, don't naturally match as well as, as bipolars. There are, FETs, even off the same wafer, can have a large range of uh, threshold voltage. So for somebody to make this nice architecture out of available single JFETs that are Ns and Ps, Really, if they're going to do it right, they really have to manually match these parts. That's not a nice thing to have to do. The um, dual monolithic parts really, really have very little offset from one side to the other. In fact, in my experience um, with the linear systems parts, the offsets that I've seen are just quite, quite a bit lower than the, what you see on the spec sheet. You know, you have people naturally and appropriately put in good margins on spec sheets. Nothing against that. But in reality, most of the time, these are pretty well matched parts. So they're really, really uh, friendly to this kind of circuit. Um, let's go to the next slide. Uh, one other thing that I wanted to mention um, Actually, it shows, it shows here as well. Um, for a given operating current, P-channel JFETs tend to have more transconductance than N-channel MOSFETs. So in this arrangement, really, you also want the transconductance of the upper stage to be pretty much the same as the transconductance of the lower stage because you really want the signal contribution to this node over here to be the same from this differential pair as, the, as from this differential pair. And in fact, uh, in theory, I won't go deep into it, but you can actually, if these two guys are, are producing different amounts of signal current over into the vast stage, you can have them fighting each other. Uh, and the reason is that with this this path here, which is the compensation path. This is shunt feedback, and shunt feedback likes to make this part of the circuit look like a voltage source or a low impedance source. And this part down here like look make it look like a voltage source. Two voltage sources with a different voltage are going to fight. So you really don't want that to. So to the extent possible, you'd like to match the transconductance of the upper pair to the bottom pair. All you have to do there is put in a little bit of degeneration here, and you, you've cured that problem. Um, the other thing I wanted to show on this slide is there's a very elegant uh, difference in this circuit, uh, popularized by John Curl, and that's the floating tail. Um, if you recall, in the earlier slides, we had a current source tail current source for this guy and a tail current source for that guy. But because these are depletion mode devices, they naturally want to have a higher voltage on the source than on the gate and the inverse down here. So there naturally wants to be a voltage difference from here to here. The devices, the way they work, make that happen. So all you have to do is put a resistor from here to here, and you've effectively formed a current source that biases these guys up beautifully. So you've not only saved the, the transistors and whatever circuitry that you used in the current sources that were used in the earlier design, but you also have a floating current source that doesn't have any uh, capacitance to ground. There's no nonlinear capacitance from the current sources that we were using before. So this is really a very nice, elegant design, and a lot, a lot of people use this. The Parasound amplifiers, for example, have this in them. Of course, they were designed by John Curl. What else? Um, the, um, the, only, the only thing here you have to worry about a little bit is that the current that's going through here depends on the pinch-off voltages of these guys and these guys. Or rather than say pinch-off voltages, 
let's say, the operating gate voltage that's needed to operate them at the current that you designed it for. Okay, so for example, these guys here, uh, they're running, each one of these is running at two milliamp here. So these FETs, the particular FETs that I use here, which may be different from different batches, these guys, when they're operating at two milliamps, they're gonna have 1.53 volts of reverse bias. These guys down here, differently, these are, what was that, minus 0.87 or something like that. But the point is that in this circuit, if you were to have a fixed resistor here, you would always want the sum of the operating reverse bias of this and this to be the same correct value to be placed across that resistor to get the current that you want. Where am I going with this? Well, what it says is that if you keep this resistor fixed, you're going to have to pick pairs, uh, like an, a, a, an N channel pair with a certain voltage here and, and another P channel pair that has the desired voltage here. As long as the sum of those operating reverse bias voltages is the same, you're okay because you'll have the same amount of voltage across that resistor. That costs money, it's a little bit harder to do, you don't always have the parts you want. So in most cases you should have a pot in here. So you can put in the, the transistors that you have within reason and adjust that pot. And in fact that's what I did in the design that I'm talking about here. Yes, Jim? VGS or RDSS? VGS, yes. Uh, those two are related, but in this case it's operating VGS. In other words, the reverse bias that's needed to cause these to conduct two milliamps. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so now uh, we've taken the same idea, the floating tail, we put in the helper current mirror that's loaded on top and bottom. You can see we've still got all the symmetry and this is basically to first order the uh, IPS, which just stands for input stage, and VAS of the amplifier that I ended up having uh, that was the modded version of the Haffler. Now of course there's, no, there's nothing about this circuit that says it has to be used with like a Haffler lateral MOSFET back end. You can use this, this stage, this combination, with a bipolar amplifier or with a vertical MOSFET. Uh, that's why this talk is a little bit more uh, input voltage amplifier stage centric. Um, now, by the way, the other thing about this that's nice is not only do you have the push-pull VAS, but notice you've got now plus and minus 20 milliamps available to drive the output stage. That's another nice thing to have. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Okay, now there's one more nice trick that we can do. Uh, again, because we've made things and this is only the top half, by the way. It's not the bottom half. There's just, you know, that's redundant. Uh, remember we said earlier that we put in a helper on this current mirror, and by doing that, we get these two nodes to be at the same voltage if we play our cards right over here, which is not hard to do. Well, that gives us another opportunity. Not only do we have that same 4.7K load resistor in there, to stabilize the vast operating current, but now we can put in clamping diodes. Now, since there's no, the, the signal across these diodes is very, very small when in normal operation. So the, the, the placement of these diodes in here is not gonna cause any problems, but what it does for you is it, when you go into clipping this, uh, the voltages, on both sides here are constrained to be plus or minus one VBE, voltage drop across a diode or, or a transistor junction. So that forces the clipping at this point in the circuit to be of controlled magnitude 
and symmetrical. And one of the things I often believe with amplifiers and the sound they produce is that a lot of times amplifiers sound different because they're misbehaving differently. Amplifiers misbehave a lot more than you think they do. Um, and it's not just, you know, measuring them on the test bench with an AP, you know, with a resistive load and seeing really, really good numbers. It, with real music, especially if it's well-recorded music that has a good dynamic range, good crest factor, and if your speakers are not high efficiency, um, you would find that amplifiers clip a lot more than you think. Um, and, and I've had the situation and I, I, at RMAF one time we did a demonstration on um, one of my favorite CDs that has this big crest factor happens to be Ricky Lee Jones uh, Ghetto of My Mind on her uh, Flying Cowboys album. That has the biggest crest factor I've ever seen on a CD and in fact that CD is recorded at a lower level than normal CD. So if you have a stack of different cuts and you come to that cut, you're going to have to turn up the volume because they had to put in more headroom on the recording process to accommodate this, the peaks on that thing. And uh, there's this, the peaks largely come from the thwack of a snare drum. And it, it's just an unbelievable peak that comes through. And I've looked at it on a digital storage scope and actually uh, even the signal coming out of the CD player at the very, very top of, of the thwack, it's actually clipped a tiny, tiny bit. So they really played it close. But anyway, the, the whole point here is that with an average power of maybe one watt in a fairly small room at RMAF, we're not talking about bleeding ear listening levels, nice realistic listening levels, with speakers that maybe only have 85 dB sensitivity, we were clipping a 250 watt power amplifier. <laughs> so the whole point here is that you have to consider how an amplifier behaves when it's misbehaving, when it's clipping or other things, parasitic oscillations, that's a whole other story. Um, so anyway, this gives us an opportunity to sort of keep things under control. If you didn't have these diodes here, when this thing clipped, you could end up, for example, overloading this, this uh, um, emitter follower transistor, because this thing without these diodes could pull this node very, very low, cause this guy to conduct an awful lot of current through there, because he's trying, trying to drive the, the base of this guy and when it's clipping, this guy is in saturation. So you could, in some cases, you might even burn that transistor out. So this gets, gets everything sort of under control. And in fact, if in addition to this, you put a little bit of base resistance in there, you can actually define under the clipping condition how much current, how much maximum current is going to go through that transistor. So it just keeps things civilized. Uh, let's go to the next uh, slide, please. Now, I'm trying to remember uh, what I did differently here. Uh, I, I actually didn't make enough notes, other, other than saying, you know, we're just using these transistors. Uh, oh, no, no, right down here, okay. Oh, oh, yes, 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 I'm sorry. Um, the, another beautiful thing about a DC servo is that it will not only correct the offset of your power amplifier, but it will correct a certain amount of DC offset from the source. Now remember, 90% of the amplifiers you see out there have a coupling capacitor here. Well, you know, that affects the low end, it has to be a high quality capacitor, blah, blah, blah. And virtually every preamp on the planet has an output coupling capacitor anyway. If you sold me a preamp and I put a voltmeter on the output, on the line output of the preamp, and I saw 10 or 100 millivolts of offset, I'd say, what in the heck's wrong with this thing, you know? So why have redundant couple, AC coupling? You're putting another 
uh, low frequency roll off into your chain. With a DC servo, no problemo, because it'll, if, even if you do buy that preamp that had 10 millivolts or 100 millivolts of offset at its output, this, the DC servo is just going to correct it. It's going to be fine. You don't need this coupling capacitor here. And in the design that I did, the DC servo can correct up to 150 millivolts plus and minus of input offset. So that's going to improve your base, at least nominally, and it lowers the cost. Let's go to the, uh, oh, one other thing here. Um, the uh, VBE multiplier, which I'm going to talk a little bit about more in a moment. This is a slightly different kind of uh, bias spreader uh, called a complementary feedback pair. Most uh, bias spreaders you see are just a single transistor um, VBE multiplier, and they have a certain impedance, and if the current going through here, the bias current in the VAS changes, you're going to change the bias in the output stage, and that's not a good thing. This particular bias spreader has a much, much lower impedance, so it's not going to change as much if you have some error in this, in this um, standing current in the VAS. Let's go to the next slide, please. Um, and this is it. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. It's a very simple, straightforward circuit. Basically, this is like an ordinary VBE multiplier to set the bias. Remember, Nelson pointed out, you need to turn these output transistors on. You need some bias. You need some forward bias. That's what this stage does. In this case, it creates about one and a half volts uh, forward bias uh, for the N-channel device and minus 1.2 volts for the P-channel device in the output stage. Um, and, and this transistor is really just, uh, this is why it's called a complementary uh, feedback pair. This guy is the opposite sex, and he, in the connection he has, lowers the impedance of this whole thing. So it's, the change in the bias is much less than you would get otherwise if you have variations in the bias current in uh, the vast stage. Now one other thing that David Haffler did, which was well thought out, is that he realized that you, you cannot put too much voltage, uh, you cannot over voltage the gate on a MOSFET, otherwise you can blow it up. The gate is very, very, uh, the gate isolation part is a very, very thin dielectric and uh, on various different FETs, both lateral and vertical, uh, they can only withstand about 15 or 20 volts on the gates. So in the, in, just to make sure that under fault conditions or something like that, you don't want to blow out those MOSFETs, uh, David Haffler put in this clever little circuit so that, for example, let's say you short the output, okay? Um, this will never let the voltage up here that's going to the driver that's driving the lateral MOSFET, never let that go above about plus 11 volts with respect to the output. So uh, one thing I've changed a little bit on this circuit is I added these two resistors which um, force, use the same voltage to cause um, the Zener diode to be somewhat reverse biased because Zener diodes do have higher capacitance. Uh, if you didn't have this here, you know, these two guys are just floating. You don't know who's carrying more current, whatever. So I don't know whether it makes a big difference, but I thought it was a neat idea to just put these two little cheap resistors in here to sort of just try and define it to be in a, in a mode that might be a little bit more friendly. Next slide, please. Here, finally, we come to the output stage. Um, this is very similar to the sort of things that Nelson was talking about. Uh, in the Haffler, there's uh, two pairs, uh, the, um, the old 2SK134 and the 2SJ49. Those have long since stopped being manufactured. They're still treasured by a lot of people. But these happen to be the transistors that were used in the Haffler. And I kept them. Just used the same transistors. Uh, nowadays, you know, you might get transistors from Renaissance or Semilab or another, just a number of companies that are making lateral MOSFETs. 
that can be pretty much substituted here just if you adjust the bias properly. Um, there's really not a lot um, sophisticated going on here. Um, one thing that um, Nelson didn't touch on is that uh, MOSFETs like to oscillate. They're a wideband device, so they need gate stopper resistors, and that's what you see here. These things tone down their, their natural tendency to oscillate a little bit. Uh, you notice in the Haffler, he used a different value for the N channel or the P channel parts as the N channel parts. I chose to just use the same values that he, that he used. I didn't get into trying to soup up that part of the circuit. There are other ways uh, to stabilize this uh, without resorting to as large a resistance here because these resistances uh, in the, in the uh, gate circuits do slow down the devices. That's why they make them less likely to oscillate. But the slower your output devices, the harder it is to really get good distortion numbers at high frequencies. So uh, I chose not to, not to fight that battle at this point. Uh, there's one other thing I wanted to point out here that I always do in my amplifiers, and that is in the driver circuits, you normally have a resistor from emitter to emitter of the driver transistors, and this creates the bias current that flows through the bias transistor, or the driver transistors, since you have like plus 1.5 volt here, minus 1.3 volt there, so you have to have some voltage that'll naturally occur from here to here. People put in a single resistor usually to set that bias current. And that bias current is fairly important. In fact, I, I like to use a larger value than most people uh, because it helps turn off the output transistors better, particularly with bipolars. But even with FETs, um, as Nelson mentioned, you have capacitance here that you need to discharge when you're turning off these devices in a class AB output stage. So you never want this transistor to lose control of what's going on in the output transistors. And of course, if all the current that was going through here is being used to turn these guys off, that transistor is off and he's lost control. So you always want enough current going through there. But in my amplifiers, I always center tap that, that resistor that's there. This is a great, fun test point. First of all, you can close the loop, the feedback loop, without going through the output transistors just by taking this feedback path and instead of connecting it there, you connect it right here. Because this is a low enough impedance that it's a small impedance compared to the load placed by the feedback network. So you can see, number one, if you're not operating the output stage, you can see how low a distortion the whole rest of the amplifier is. And you always want that to be low. In a well-designed amplifier, as Nelson pointed out, every, the real action is in the output stage. Most of the distortion is in the output stage. So if you're not designing the input and VAS to be low enough distortion to be significantly lower than the output stage, you're shortchanging yourself, okay? So that's a nice thing to be able to do. Secondly, if you close the loop and run it and look at here again, with the output stage running, you can see how well the input and voltage amplifier stages are operating when they're loaded by the output stage. So that's another neat thing. But the final neat thing, which I really like, is the fact that we would always like to be able to see how much distortion the output stage by, by itself is creating. Now one way to do that, which Nelson illustrated, is to drive, just have an output stage, drive it with a big signal, and measure the distortion. That's just a basic open loop measurement. <coughs> this trick, now this is not for listening though. What he did is very, very good for listening. But for measurement, if you operate this whole thing closed loop, and you put a distortion analyzer on that test point, you are actually seeing 
the distortion of the output stage. You're actually seeing the inverse of the distortion. You're seeing the, the distortion of the signal that is required to make the output stage produce virtually no distortion here. Because remember, we've got the loop closed, so we've used negative feedback to get the distortion very low here, right? So the distortion here, you know, if you've got 40 dB of feedback, the distortion here is probably going to be, could be, a hundred times less than the distortion there. So if this distortion is close to zero, then the distortion you see here is actually the distortion level that the output stage was making. So you can make that measurement. And I actually made that measurement on the Haffler before I took it all apart and threw away most of it. And uh, I, one of my next slides, and I'm getting close to being done, fortunately. Oh, one other thing I like to do here is I put in these um, 0.1 ohm resistors in the rails, very convenient way to measure the bias current that I'm putting through the output stage. And in fact, the other thing I've done here is I've biased this pretty hot. I like to bias it hot. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more that, that, about that in a moment. The Haffler, the, this number here, the current flowing through each pair is on the order of 120 milliamps, which is pretty good. But with MOSFETs, they, they are not critical with bias. They're sort of in the zone of the more bias, the better. That's not always the case with bipolars. That's why bipolars, you have to adjust the value of the bias to a particular value. If you're want, willing to run hot with a MOSFET and you've got enough heat sink, be my guest, run it hot. And that's what I like to do. Um, if, if, if the uh, heat sink is uh, relatively just barely warm, um, it's, you're not taking advantage of it enough because when you're running a big audio signal through it, it's going to get hot. So at idle, again, we don't care about the power meter in the DIY, DIY world. You bias it so it's running a little bit hotter. Um, the other thing there is that when the music level changes, there's going to be a less thermal change in the heat sink and in the operating temperature of the output devices, right? Because if they're running hot at idle and they're running hot under heavy duty signal conditions, then the change in temperature isn't as great as a function of the music. And that can cause some kinds of distortion, like some people call it memory distortion. It can just mess up the bias in the output stage. If you have a big bass note, right, sometimes the transistors will heat up. Now the heat sink's not going to change much under those conditions. This is a different illustration. But if you, if you have a big bass note, heats up the junctions of the output transistors, and if that causes the bias to shift because their, their uh, base emitter voltage changes when they get hot, after that, the amplifier may end up being under-biased because things cool down quicker than the adjustment was, was made by the bias circuit. So anyway, these guys, it's nice to run them hot, and there'll be another reason I'll, I'll touch on in a second. Um, let's go to, oh, one other thing. Um, this 0.1 ohm resistor here gives you an opportunity uh, to get some filtering with your local bypass. You always want to have, um, in my mind at least, a pretty good sized storage capacitor right at the output transistors. Now we always have big reservoir capacitors in the power supply, which may be, you know, six inches away, something like that. We may have 30,000 microfarads on each side of the rail back there. But you also want to have some serious capacitance right here because you want to localize the current flow. The current created by these guys up here you know, the half cycle thing with a class AB amplifier is a highly nonlinear current. You really don't want that highly nonlinear current flowing through a long distance of wire back to the power supply. So if you make the AC current loop very, very local using these capacitors, you sort of resolve that current back to a linear current right locally, which is a good thing. Secondly, 
Another stage of filtering here uh, really helps clean up the power supply for the earlier stages. It also uh, prevents a lot of the high frequency components here from getting back into here. Now some output stages go, non, or, or go into an oscillatory state somewhat because you have inductances here and you can actually get a feedback path uh, this is worse with bipolars, by the way. A feedback path that goes around, if you didn't have this filter here and you have some inductance, you get a feedback path with a loop there and that can cause some of the oscillation problems you see in some output stages. So that's just one other thing that I like to do is put some, some extra filtering there in the rails. Uh, next slide, please. Now, here is a measurement that I talked about earlier about measuring in situ the distortion of the output stage. So this is actually the distortion um, of the Haffler amplifier output stage before I messed with it, before I threw all half the stuff away. And um, it's really not too bad. Uh, here we have, oh, and this is static distortion. This is like one kilohertz, and that's where a lot of the distortion in these stages come from. Um, you can see that with an 8 ohm load, you know, you're, you're down in the 0.01 range at low power and you're coming up. And these are pretty good numbers for an output stage, particularly for a, a, a lateral MOSFET output stage because they have lower transconductance, so they tend to have more distortion um, because in the crossover region they lose transconductance because they're both operating at a lower current. We call that transconductance droop. And when the transconductance goes down, the incremental gain of the output stage goes down, and that's distortion. So, uh, but anyway, you know, here we have, uh, actually it was, it was 140 per pair that, that the, mm -hmm. uh, the Haffler was operating at. And you can see that the distortion, as expected, uh, is higher for 4 ohms, but it's really not bad. Look at how low it is, by the way, when you don't put any load on it. So this, this is really, this distortion is a function of current. It's current dependent distortion. When you're making those output transistors uh, source or sink current, that's when they're going to make more distortion. So this is the distortion that the feedback in the amplifier is going to be used to reduce, to get a good distortion number. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. This, by the way, is the spectrum of that distortion that we just looked at. Uh, this is only at one watt, but remember, Nelson points out, I, I, he may have coined the term, the first watt, I'm sure he did, right? That first watt counts for a lot. So look at how nice this distortion profile is for these lateral MOSFETs. Really goes down. Uh, on this plot, which only goes down to minus 100 dB, you don't even see the fourth and the fifth, not to mention the, the sixth and the seventh and the eighth and the ninth. So this is a very, very well-behaved distortion spectrum. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Here we see the same thing at eight watts. Now at eight watts, we are into the class AB region where the transistors are turning on and turning off. That earlier stage that I was talking about when it was operating at one watt, it was actually in its class A region of operation. So now you can see that we, now that we're in class AB, uh, the distortion's still not too bad, but you can see that the upper harmonics have made their presence known. They're not terrible. And, you know, it's not something that, as Nelson put, you lose sleep over. But you can see that they're starting to come up. This is at 8 watts. Now I'll go to the next slide, please. Here we have uh, 50 watts. Uh, the THD has gone up to 0.3%. That's what you would have seen on that earlier slide with the curves. Uh, and you can see, once again, that the higher order harmonics are starting to, to come up. They're still not really out of control, uh, but the point here is that at these higher power levels, when you go into the class AB range, you're going to get a little bit more of the higher order harmonics. Next slide, please. Now, this is the distortion of 
the modified Hafler, um, I very presumptuously put a C on the end of it, which stands for Cordell, <laughs> just so I could distinguish it and have something to call it. Um, but here you can see I've, I've got the bias up there at 400 milliamps, and uh, in the uh, audible, you know, the one kilohertz range, uh, you can see that the distortion is like, you know, 001 at low power. And, and here, of course, you're getting into the clipping range, but, you know, before you get too hardly, hard to clip, you know, it's still, you know, 005 which is pretty low, 005%. Um, at 20 kilohertz, amplifiers always have more distortion. There's more nonlinearities that come into play. You have less feedback to reduce, reduce the distortion. So you get higher distortion, but this is still a quite good number. You're well below 0.01 up to clipping. So this amplifier is performing really quite well. Um, and it's largely due to those various factors I pointed out, the input stage and the voltage amplifier stage. They're, they're much better stages than the Hafler originally had. We're, we're biasing the output MOSFETs at a higher current. All those things taken together uh, have dropped that distortion quite a bit. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. Now here you see um, distortion as a function of frequency for three different power levels. So it's sort of a, just a different way of looking at pretty much the same information we saw on the last slide. Once again, at one watt, look at this. Uh, as a function of frequency, it's very, very nice, like below point oh. By the way, the scales on this are different by a factor of 10. So now we're talking, you know, this is minus 120 dB. Uh, this is minus 100 dB. Um, so at one watt, you know, th there's virtually no distortion. So again, this really passes the first watt uh, step or criteria. And even as we go to higher power, you know, like 10 watts is, is important because there's a lot of stuff still going on at 10 watts. And you can see it's pretty well behaved at 10 watts. And even at 75 watts, it's still, you know, in the 001 kind of range, although it starts to creep up uh, as you get to the higher power. And this is oftentimes a, a function of the fact that we're using lateral MOSFETs. Uh, this, this amplifier, by the way, the original DH220 uh, would clip at about 120 watts per channel or so, something like that. The numbers that you see here, the clipping is coming a little bit earlier because all of these tests that I did were done uh, with a non-Hafler power supply. It was a bench supply that I used that happens to sag uh, a bit more. At high so this amplifier actually clips at about 90 watts, 91 watts. Uh, so all of these numbers would be a lot better if I put it you know, back into the to the Hafler chassis and because they have a you know, really, really nice, good power transformer. And, and another thing that I changed in the Hafler was I put in uh, some newer uh, rectifiers and uh, uh, reservoir capacitors so that clean that up. The old capacitors were dried out anyway. Uh, so, you know, again, uh, it's, it's kind of a nice improvement in performance. Uh, next slide, please. Now here's another thing, uh, this actually touches on a little bit of what Nelson was talking about, and that's the class A region. You like amplifiers with a large class A region. Now one thing about class A is that when you're in the class A region, um, the amount of power that's being supplied to the amplifier is largely independent of the amount of power that the amplifier is putting out. So we can tell by looking at input power versus output power, roughly when we're transitioning from the class A region to the class AB region. And, um, you know, where I, where I chose to put this is pretty arbitrary. Uh, you know, Mother Nature doesn't like sharp transitions, right? So you don't see something like going here, you know, and then suddenly up with a straight line. It gradually transitions, but for all practical purposes, this amplifier 
um, operates in class A up to almost two watts, which is a nice number. Um, most bipolar amplifiers really don't even come close to that. That's another reason why a lot of people like uh, MOSFET amplifiers. You can bias them as much as you want. The more bias, the bigger the class A region. Uh, a, a lot of bipolar amplifiers, they don't, they don't even make it to a half a watt in, before they transition to AB. So that's another nice thing about this. And of course, this is partially a result of the fact that we're biasing it at 400 milliamps. Um, when you've got, when, when, when you are at the edge of the class A region, you are putting out 800 milliamps or so into the speaker. So that's a significant amount of current to be able to be putting out while you're still in the class A region. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just a um, very summary of the performance. There's really nothing here uh, except the noise, I guess, uh, that I talked about. The noise, that input stage produces very low noise uh, because you're actually paralleling two types of input stages together and that, reduce, that alone reduces the noise by 3 dB. Uh, but there's other things that are going on in that input stage in this particular design that really brought the noise down. Now, 5 nanovolts per root hertz is really, really, really good for a power amplifier. Um, if any of you remember the old, the Halcro amplifiers, which were very expensive, very high performance, they bragged about five nanovolts per root hertz. Uh, so we've achieved that here. Uh, also, at the same time, we've got 104 dB of A-weighted signal-to-noise ratio referenced to one watt. That is also a very, very good number. Now. Uh, one of the reasons I'm um, sort of putting some emphasis on this is the fact that going back to the linear integrated systems dual monolithic JFETs, remember that the LSK489 and the LSJ689 are noisier by nature than, say, the LSK389. So a lot of people are saying, oh, you know, we, we really ought to, we want a low noise power amplifier. We want to use the LSK389. You don't need to, especially with this circuit. So these, the point I'm trying to make is, if anybody tells you that uh, these dev devices are noisier than, um, you know, like the old Toshiba's, which was like a two, what was it, a 2SK389, something like that. In an application like this, it doesn't matter. Part of the reason it doesn't matter is that the input devices themselves are not the only contributors to noise. There are a lot of other contributors to noise in the input stage of a power amplifier. So you don't need to go to the LSK389 to get noise that's exceptional. And of course, there isn't a complement yet uh, to the LSK389. So these guys are perfect devices going forward for building amplifiers with JFET full complementary input stages. Next slide. We're just about done. <laughs> That's just a picture of the prototype. It's just done on perf board. And uh, it's, this is actually the Hafler heat sink that the, the amplifier came with. and. Uh, you can't see it, but there's a ridge under here where uh, you can't put any components. Basically, what you see here, though, is this is the full complementary input stage. Up here is the complementary push-pull VAS and drivers. This is the bias circuit right here, uh, including the gate protection. And down here is the DC servo. Last slide, please. You've already heard everything I've got on this. So with that, I will conclude.